so how difficult was it to you for you to get uh, the interview first of all with him um well i didn't interview him i just stopped by well, for a visit but um well last year when i went and visited i just organized it with him and his lawyer and it was really simple and um the the embassy wasn't really involved at all this time i had to fill out a form uh detailing like where I work, my employer's address, all my social media accounts. If I wanted to bring my phone in, I would have had to provide the IMEI and serial number and all kinds of other information about any device I brought. Um, I figured it'd be easier just to leave it behind. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was, there was a little bit of a process this time. And you, uh, in terms of the phone, when they say bring it along, they still keep it at the front desk, don't they? You can't bring it into the room and use it as a tape recorder, for example. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that they would hold it at the front. Yeah. I ended up just having my boyfriend hold it for me outside. Yeah. Um, so you went so to London just for this uh, interview. Did you have the clear? Did you know that you had? Sorry, interview meeting with Julian. Really Seventeen hours. Interview. Did you know about this um, uh, before you left, or did you go there and have to wait for approval from the embassy? Um, well, I was going to London anyways, oh, so okay. it wasn't planned around this, but. Um, I wasn't sure if I would get approved or not until two days before. <laughs> so right. Uh, so tell us now. Hard. Tell us now about your experience entering uh, the embassy and going in to see Julian and what the meeting was like with him. Um, okay. Well, getting in was pretty similar, aside from you know filling out the paperwork and stuff like that, having to get approval from the ambassador. Um, it was all pretty similar to last year when I went. Um, they scan you with a metal detector when you go in and search your bags, which didn't really bother me because Julian has a lot of enemies and I'd rather that they be doing that. But then once I was inside, the amount of cameras and microphones was, I mean, it had to have been double or triple what it was last year. Last year there was, you know, cameras here and there, but they weren't um, everywhere. Now, no matter where you're standing, no matter where you are, there's a camera picking you up and from pretty much every angle also, which was a little bit dystopian and creepy. And uh, we tried to go into another room to get some privacy so that we could speak freely. And they came and pounded on the door and they were like, no, you have to go back. So we ended up in the conference room and we tried to put on uh, like the radio and a white noise machine, but it was it was still uh, it was so obvious that we were being recorded that we ended up just passing notes, which is a little bit insane to me. <laughs> so. Was most of your discussion with him um, in in a written form then? Um, I mean, pretty much, yeah. We. We spoke, obviously, but a lot of things um, we had to write down so that it wouldn't be picked up by the microphones or the cameras. How long were you with him? Uh, it was supposed to be an hour. I ended up staying, I think, a little over two hours before they threw me out. <laughs> threw you out? Did they come into the room and literally tell you you had to leave? Yeah. What can you tell us? Was this off the record? I mean, your discussions with uh, Assange, or can you tell us something about what you learned from that? Yeah, no, it was everything was off record. He's not really allowed to speak about politics or his conditions of his asylum right now. So um, I wouldn't want to jeopardize him in any way by oh, yeah. discussing that. And I it's understand. a shame because <laughs> the thing that really struck me is that he's not allowed to talk about his feelings or his thoughts on social media right now or to the public or press, but he, and that's bad, but he can't even, speak freely about his thoughts and ideas to his friends and to reporters at the embassy where he's living and that i feel like is a is a really scary thing so you could you can tell us something about his demeanor and um, uh, how he's um, holding up under these uh, uh, terrible conditions i mean he was in really good spirits um we were joking around and had a good time he was you know as well as could be expected given the situation. He looked a little bit thinner than last time I saw him, but overall um, he was pretty, he was tough. You know, he's still bright, still sharp. Um, they haven't broken him, <laughs> so that's good. And you're feeling that they won't be able to break him from what you saw? No, I don't think they will be able to. 
he's strong and he knows how important his fight is. And I don't think that he'll give that up for anything. Yes, um, he knows. Uh, uh, you, so you don't know about or how he's eating or he certainly doesn't have exercise other than maybe a exercise bike that, uh, that he has, I think, in his room. Yeah, I don't know. There was a lot of fruit around. We had some coffee. The coffee was good. <laughs> I don't really know um, about his eating or anything like that. I can say that it was warm, at least in, you know, the lobby and the conference room and the office and general living spaces. I didn't go into his room, but I, I know that a lot of people were really worried about the heat situation. It, it was warm um, in at least the common areas. So without divulging any details, can you say that he is, despite being cut off from the outside world in terms of the internet and having few visitors beside his lawyers, and now uh, there seems to be a window opened where people like yourself can, and John Pilger and Ang Angela Richter, the uh, theater director, went to see him in the last few weeks. But can you can you tell us that he seems to be informed about what's going on, uh, A, in the world politically, and B, uh, about his own situation, his own case. Oh, absolutely. He's definitely filled in on, you know, world affairs. It's Julian, you know. He's he yeah. is not only aware and filled in on what's going on, he has very interesting perspectives. His He's brilliant. His mind is still, you know, going. He's, he's exactly how you would expect. <laughs> Strong opinions, uh, very smart opinions things that you wouldn't necessarily think of and um so on that on that front he's really doing well i think it's just unfortunate now you know here in the, those with the world yeah here in the u.s prisoners uh, in, in I, I think in federal prisons uh, are not allowed anymore to get books and it was always difficult to send a book to a prisoner anyway um does he have access to books and newspapers, do you know? Um, I'm not sure, but I, I would assume so. I think I think he can get books and things and, like that. And not denying a paper, a print edition of a newspaper. even So he could actually read a paper and get his hands dirty with ink. Yeah, not have I to because he can't go online. Yeah, I think there were papers around. There were books around. Um, he definitely D has access to information. He just it's more that it's less that they don't want him to know what's going on in the world. It's that they don't want him to share his opinions. And I think they're succeeding right. on that. Um, and if he does to someone like you, you can't talk about it. So they've effectively shut him up. Yeah. Do you, did you get any impression of what his relations are like with the staff at the embassy? Um, it wasn't as friendly and warm as when I went last year. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, last year, I remember after I left, I commented to someone, I was like, oh, wow, at least he has like really cool people around him. And you know, the, the people at the embassy seem really nice. And I, I remember being really happy with how, how cool everybody was. This time, it, it definitely wasn't like that. Um, they seemed a lot colder, a lot more standoffish, a lot more strict. I noticed that there was like a, a sign in the bathroom directing him which way the toilet paper had to hang on the roll. And it was like the most serious little note ever. And I was just like, this is insane. Like they're cherry picking all these like weird little things. And um, it was just bizarre. They just, it wasn't the welcoming situation that it was last year. So it went from being cool to cold is what you're saying. Yeah. They were cool before. So that kind of a note in the toilet, it's interesting. That clearly is part of a strategy to try to drive her crazy to get out to, so he leaves. That's what they were trying to do. Isn't that your impression? They want to yeah. get him out because it's it difficult. It seemed like they're just nitpicking like little things to be irritating. And, um, you know, the embassy was very clean <laughs> when I went. I don't, I can't even imagine it being not clean. So I feel like they're like picking on these little tiny issues like toilet paper and stuff just to be annoying and want to drive them out, you know. So clearly that other room you went into didn't have a camera or a microphone in it. That's what they're um, well, I asked that, and he was like, "Well, it's better. It's best to assume that everything is bugged, yeah. but uh, there weren't like visible. It wasn't as obvious as in the the conference room. The conference room, it's like you're sitting in a fish tank. Well, that's pretty extraordinary. Always, too. Yeah, always all 
like every every bit of the hallways had cameras. It was insane. I'm curious. Does he, he does he know why they're suddenly allowing visitors? Do you have any insight into that? Um, well, they had put out the new protocol, which after his isolation mostly ended, um, they had put out rules uh, saying, you know, how what guidelines visitors have to take and stuff. And um, I guess they stuck to letting him have people come as long as they get the approval. So what is your over by, by the new rules? Hmm. So you, he's not leaving. He's as defiant as ever. Uh, the government's slightly relaxed uh, his conditions by allowing visitors like yourself. Mm -hmm. What is your understanding of the current situation in terms of what Ecuador is trying to do right now? Uh, they're giving mixed signals. They want him out. Then it's not important. And then it's between the UK and, and, and Assange's lawyers, and we have nothing to do with it and all this stuff. Do you have any particular insight into that? Um, well, I mean... Around D.C., there's been a lot of talk about how it's Pence uh, and that Pence and Pompeo have been really adamant about getting Julian and that it hasn't been like so much the people like Trump and his people, but Pence, um, although I think that's kind of just passing the buck, but that's been the most of the talk I've heard around here. And I think Ecuador has some debts and they're looking for a bailout. And the US said, you know, if you don't go after Chevron and you hand us Julian Assange, then we'll be more willing to play ball. Yeah. And I think that they want that money and that they don't, the new president doesn't particularly care about Julian Assange. He doesn't care about press freedom the way that their previous president did. And so um, I think he's willing to make a deal with the devil. As American officials don't care about press freedom, mm -hmm. without telling us what he said, if you can, did he, was he aware of what Giuliani said, for example? Uh, is he aware that he's been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize? It was actually the same day that you were there that the nom that uh, married uh, McGuire nominated him. So maybe that news hadn't filtered into you either. Uh, I hadn't is, heard about the the Nobel Peace Prize while I was there, but we, um, you know, that we did talk about Giuliani a bit. I see Giuliani mm -hmm. really, really frequently because uh, I hang out at Trump Hotel a lot, but, uh, and he's always there. Oh. So I had, I had spoke to him oh, I gotta before. Hmm? Yeah. I've got to start hanging out there too now, <laughs> it sounds like. You should. It's, That's, it's uh, the place to go. It. Everybody always jokes. That I was there once. Everybody jokes there that I'm yeah. the unofficial WikiLeaks lobbyist. As soon as I see like Sarah Sanders or anyone there, I run up with questions about WikiLeaks. I'm kind of a pest, but it's the place. Well, that's good. That's what a reporter should be. Yeah. A good reporter is a pest. Yeah, you have to be able to do that. I was there once and I was turned off by the decor and then I didn't go back, but that was a mistake on my part. So oh, you got typical it. Trump you style. Me hey, sometime, you know. I'll take you. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you'll be there when I go. But yes, let's do that. Well, Cassandra, thanks very much for your time with us today. And it was great that you went to see him. And let's hope that uh, the news gets better. Okay. Thank you so if you much. Have to, if you want to stick around for the discussion, please stick uh, around. But if you have to go, we understand. Run.